In this slideshow, we'll be discussing normal vision, types of refractive error, specifically myopia, hyperopia, astigmatism, and presbyopia, how they relate to chronic vision loss, and how they can be treated through corrective lenses and or surgery. Normal vision is called emetropia. Light rays entering the eye must be bent or refracted so they can focus on the retina, where an image will be formed and sent to the brain through the optic nerve. This refraction contributes to our visual acuity. Most of our major refraction occurs in two places, the cornea and the lens. Our lens has the ability to change its refractive power depending on our need to focus on near or distant objects. This process is known as accommodation. Recall that the muscles in the ciliary body of our eye can contract to increase or decrease the thickness and curvature of the lens. So what exactly is refractive error? Refractive error occurs when light is not bent properly to focus on the retina. This can happen when the cornea, lens, or even the entire eye are shaped abnormally, or when we lose the ability to accommodate. As a result, visual acuity is impaired. These images are examples of how refractive error results in a focal point that is too anterior or posterior to the retina, resulting in a blurry image. While the genetics aren't exactly known, many of these conditions are inherited. Risk factors for children with refractive errors include those who are born prematurely, have parents with refractive errors, have Down syndrome, or have certain systemic conditions. These risk factors apply mostly to myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. Presbyopia, as we'll see later on, is a unique class of refractive error that develops through a different mechanism. Signs and symptoms of refractive error include blurred vision, squinting, headaches, fatigue with visual tasks, and failure to pass vision screening tests. These can range from mild, even unnoticeable to the patient, to severe cases requiring intervention. Myopia and hyperopia can be grouped together and are both inherited, appear during late childhood, and often worsen during adolescence as the body begins to rapidly grow. During adulthood, refractive error tends to stabilize and does not usually worsen. In myopia, which is commonly called nearsightedness, the focal point lands anterior to the retina. This results in impaired distant vision. Hyperopia is the opposite. The focal point is posterior to the retina. If an individual's process of accommodation cannot compensate for this, it will result in impaired near vision, called farsightedness. Generally, treatment involves using corrective lenses with glasses or contacts, or surgeries such as LASIK. These simplified images show how corrective lenses can shift the focal point back onto the retina. These lenses will only correct one measurement and will be concave or negative for myopia and convex or positive for hyperopia. Astigmatism is a bit more complex. It occurs when the cornea or the lens are regularly shaped. It has a number of subtypes depending on the shape of the cornea and where the focal lines land with respect to the retina. If that isn't complicated enough, it often occurs with myopia or hyperopia, where the shape of the whole eye is distorted. Looking at the image on the bottom right, we can see astigmatism often results in two focal lines, a horizontal and a vertical one. This causes impaired vision of both near and far objects. Although the etiology is unknown, risk factors for developing astigmatism include family history and history of eye disease or eye trauma. Because near and far vision are affected, corrective lenses for astigmatism are cylindrical and will have three measurements depending on the presence of any myopia or hyperopia, the amount of astigmatism, which is based on the curvature of the cornea or lens, and location or axis of stigmatism. Some cases may require specialty corrective lenses or surgery to treat. Presbyopia, on the other hand, is a result of the normal aging process. In fact, the word presbyopia comes from a Greek word meaning old eye. As we get older, the crystalline lens in our eye loses its elasticity, which makes it more difficult for our ciliary muscles to change its shape. As a result, our visual acuity for close objects decreases, usually around the age of 44 to 46 years old. This process is irreversible and can worsen for a few years, but will ultimately stabilize. For near objects, the focal point will fall posterior to the retina. Therefore, a plus lens can be used to correct presbyopia. This is why many older adults often require reading glasses. Presbyopia can also occur with myopia and hyperopia. In cases like these, bifocals can be used to provide two different prescriptions on the same lens. Having the same refractive error in both eyes is usually not a problem, but if the error is different in one eye than the other, called anisometropia, it can lead to acquired strabismus if left untreated in childhood and eventually to loss of vision in a functional eye, which is called amblyopia. This can become permanent. It happens because, as one eye attempts to compensate for the other, the eye muscles can become misaligned. Adults with acquired strabismus frequently develop double vision, but children with strabismus quickly learn to ignore or suppress the image seen by the deviated eye, resulting in amblyopia. 
As a result of suppression, the straight or good eye takes over most of the work of seeing, and the lazy or amblyopic eye develops reduced central vision because of lack of use. Strabismus or crossing of the eye is not necessary for amblyopia to occur from anisometropia. For example, children may have two straight eyes with anisometropia, but the eye with the worst refractive error will have the vision suppressed, resulting in amblyopia. If the amblyopia is detected before age 13, it can usually be reversed. The Snellen chart is one of the most common and convenient tools used to test for distance visual acuity, while the Lake Yeager chart can be used for near vision. With retinoscopy, we can objectively measure refractive error by observing light reflexes and using a plus or minus lens to neutralize a patient's refractive error. Lastly, a fluoropter can also be used to assess refractive error, but it relies on subjective responses from the patient. Thanks to technological advances, we have a number of low-risk treatment options with high success rates. Corrective lenses are the most common and affordable management approach to treating refractive error. There are many surgical options as well to treat refractive error. The most common procedures are listed here and include inserting intraocular lens, inserting corneal implants, or directly reshaping the cornea or eye with a laser, as in LASIK or PRK. Another option is called conductive keratoplasty, which uses radiofrequency energy instead of lasers. These are all low-risk outpatient procedures. In this presentation, we have covered normal vision, different types of refractive error, how to evaluate, and how to treat them. This chart summarizes the types of refractive error we covered in this presentation. They each affect vision differently and are caused by different factors. Feel free to copy this chart and practice filling it in to help remember the unique elements of each condition. Thanks for listening. For more information on any of these subjects, please visit the American Academy of Ophthalmology website.